around 2 a.m., aside from a few dim lights in the hallways, it was mostly dark. I could only make out silhouettes and shadows in my 10 by 10 cell. Lying on my back with my arms behind my head, I was deep in thought. Instead of sleeping like I should, my mind wandered to things I wished I could forget. Hearing footsteps, I started counting 7, 8, 9, 10. Then I saw him. His face was hard and emotionless, just like everyone else's here. He was just doing his job, making his rounds, not looking for friends. I wasn't sure if he saw me, but it didn't matter. He was out there and I was in here. When he passed by, I stopped counting. No point. He wouldn't be back for another 92 minutes. I looked at the ceiling, planning what to do when I got out. Five days and a wake up and I'd be leaving for good. I'd served about seven months of my one-year sentence. My job was waiting for me, but everything else would be different. My older brother had fixed my car, taken care of my house and managed my dwindling savings. Was I still angry? Angry didn't even come close, but I buried those emotions until I got out. I realized why. Guys doing 10 to 20 years come out as empty shells. All traces of humanity are left at the door when you check in. Survival is key and this place is a resort compared to the hardcore prison up north. I closed my eyes again, hoping to get a few hours of sleep. I miss my old bedroom with the blackout shades, but I knew my life would never be the same. I'll pick you up next Tuesday, my brother Gary told me over the phone in the visitor center. During our last visit, we looked at each other through the plexiglass wall, hopefully for the last time. Anything you want to eat your first night out? A steak, a big steak, medium rare. Gary grinned. Steve, you're too easy. I thought you'd ask for something tougher to sneak past my wife. You'll stay with Andy and me until you're settled. There's no food or much furniture left in your house. This gives you time to get what you need. It's not the Ritz-Carlton but it's clean and you can come and go as you please. He smiled. I didn't. Thanks, I started before he cut me off. Forget it, we're family. That's what family does. Don't worry about mom and dad. They'll come around once things settle down. But we knew that wouldn't be any time soon. Emotions ran deep on both sides. Seen my kids lately? Two weekends ago at mom and dad's. Heather looks the same, but John has this bull-shaped haircut that's all the rage. It looks awful. I told him so. You know what he said? Said I wasn't his dad and didn't have to listen to me. I would have slapped him, but mom was there. You'll have your hands full with that one. John wouldn't have dared say something like that if I was around. Even though I was his dad, he and his sister would stay with their mom after I got out. I had time, plenty of it. Once I was out of this place, I'd wait for the right moment. No rush. Even though the divorce was final, I still owned half the house. Kathy owed me about $65,000 to buy me out. She likely raided our bank lockbox, grabbing all our bonds and CDs. Thankfully, I gave my lawyer a list of everything so there would be no dispute when I got released, which would be soon. Kathy and my ex-friend Bob really screwed me over. But that was in the past. I was caught off guard the first time, and it wouldn't happen again. I was waiting, remembering, and looking forward to better days when I got out of this hellhole. Only then could I rebuild my life and start fresh. I hoped I could hold it together until then. Before jail, life was good because I never saw it coming. Weeks before, some so-called friends hinted they knew something but never said anything. What were they thinking? Did they think I knew and was okay with it? Everyone must have known. I would never have tolerated it, but people didn't want to get involved. We had a great marriage, I thought. Twelve years, two kids, a nice house and good jobs. Sure, we had minor disagreements, but I loved my wife and never imagined what she was capable of. We didn't have many friends, just a few couples from the neighborhood. Most had been married over seven years and were about our age. We all had at least two kids except Bob and his wife Connie. They'd been trying to have a child forever with no luck. Kathy probably knew why, but I tried to stay out of everyone's personal business. Connie started drinking heavily about a year ago. At first, she was just melancholy, but then it got ugly. Bob drank little, taking care of her. Bob, honey, get me another drink. She'd start. By the end of the night, she'd be demanding drinks and Bob had to carry her home. It was sad, 
but his problem, not mine. Connie was a mess tonight, I said. Getting ready for bed, I think she passed out more than once. Greg and Judy probably left early because she started undressing and asked Greg to help her. No one was letting her near the pool. I felt sorry for Bob, my wife said. Connie's devastated about not having kids, but taking it out on Bob isn't the answer. I told her she could adopt, but she wouldn't hear it. She blamed Bob for their problems. They'll either work it out or get divorced, I said. We're supposed to go out to dinner next week. I hope she behaves, but I'm not counting on it. I'll talk to her this week. Maybe she'll cool it for one night, my wife said, trying to be optimistic. Connie didn't cool it. Waiter, how's a girl supposed to get a drink around here? She yelled, slurring. She started on Bob again, and he was about to lose it when I intervened. Come on, Connie. You promised me a dance, I said, pulling her to the dance floor. She tried to refuse, but I insisted. I danced with her for three songs while my wife talked to Bob who looked miserable. When we got near the hall, Connie excused herself to the ladies' room. After five minutes, I debated what to do. I asked two women going in to check on Connie. It wasn't good. Is she wearing a bright yellow dress? One of the women asked, peeking out of the restroom. When I nodded, she shook her head. She's passed out in a stall. If you want, I'll stand guard while you get her. I went in, propped her up by the sink and splashed cold water on her face. It helped for a moment, but then she collapsed again. I practically carried her back to our table. Bob, let me help you get Connie to your car. She's out cold and won't wake up anytime soon. I stood there, holding a very drunk Connie. Bob looked embarrassed and angry. Steve, I've got it. Sit down. This isn't the first time, but it will be the last. Despite his objections, I carried her out while he grabbed her purse and said his goodbyes. I laid Connie on the back seat and patted Bob's back. Sorry, man. What else could I say? Thanks for your help. I'm at my wit's end and don't know what to do. You two need counseling. You can't figure this out alone. If you need support, call Kathy and me. We'll help however we can. All right, he replied, though I knew it was lip service. Their problems seemed too deep to fix. I gave them a couple of months, tops. I wasn't far off, but no one expected the final outcome. Three weeks later, just after 10.30 p.m. on a Thursday, we heard sirens and saw bright lights at the end of our block. Everyone ran outside to see what was happening. Kathy, stay here. I'll check it out. I joined the crowd and saw the fire rescue squad prying open Bob's car door. What's going on? Is Bob all right? It's not Bob, it's Connie. They were arguing. She grabbed his keys, ran out and sped down the street, didn't get far. Connie had rear-ended a parked car at about 40 miles per hour. The ambulance arrived, put her on a stretcher, and drove off with Bob in tow. Their front door was wide open, lights still on, and the house in disarray. I called Kathy and told her what happened, then locked up Bob's house, leaving a note that I had his keys. How's Connie? My wife asked when I got home. Not good. She wasn't wearing a seatbelt and swerved before hitting the car. The airbag deployed but her head smacked the driver's side window hard enough to shatter it. She was doing about 35 miles per hour. Bob's with her at the hospital. We'll wait. Should we go down there? He's got his hands full. We'll go tomorrow when things settle. Right now, let's get to bed. Tomorrow will come fast. We kissed goodnight but barely slept, worried about Connie. At 11 o'clock the next morning, my phone rang. Steve, Connie's on life support, my wife yelled. I'm leaving work. Bob's a mess. Someone needs to be there. Meet me at the hospital, she said frantically before hanging up. Damn, the guy couldn't catch a break. On the way, I grabbed lunch for the three of us and called Kathy's parents to pick up the kids after school. I walked quietly into the waiting room where my wife and others were consoling Bob. How's she doing? I asked. Not good, my wife whispered. The doctor talked to Bob and he hasn't said much since. Bob, I said sitting next to him. You okay? It was a dumb question, but I needed an opening line. Steve, she's not going to get better. There's little brain activity. I don't know what to do. He started to cry. I motioned for everyone to give us space. Has anyone told Connie's parents? They're on their way. Steve, the hospital staff keeps asking about a living will and donor card. 
feels like vultures circling. The doctor asked if I'd consider pulling the plug if she's brain dead. For Christ's sake, she's my wife, not a piece of meat. He was shouting now. Why can't they just fix her? They're doctors. Can't they fix her? I had no answer. Connie's parents arrived shortly after and went into her room with Bob. There was a lot of loud crying and cursing. Her father seemed to blame Bob for Connie's condition. The doctor went in and about 20 minutes later everyone came out. Her parents left heartbroken, knowing they'd never talk to their daughter again. We left the hospital around 8 o'clock and picked up the kids from Kathy's parents' house. I kept thinking, God, I hope I never have to make that choice. 48 hours later, with Bob, Connie's parents, and the doctor in the room, they turned off the machine keeping her alive. She passed away quietly. We consoled Bob as best we could. Despite her difficult behavior, Bob truly loved her. Funerals tend to bring out the good memories, not the bad ones. The funeral was packed and everyone was in tears. Bob took it hard, eventually taking a month off to visit his family back east. I assured him we'd take care of his place. I love you. You know that, don't you? I said to my wife while getting ready for bed. It had been an exhausting few weeks and things were getting back to normal. If I'm ever like Connie, just pull the plug. I wouldn't want to be kept alive by a machine. Steve, don't talk like that. Could never happen to us. Bob returned a few weeks later somewhat functional. Kathy helped him sort through Connie's belongings. After three months, he seemed to be coming to grips with it. We made sure he was included in social events. Neighbors even set him up on a few dates, but nothing came of them. Life went on or so I thought. Six months later, Bob seemed to get his spark back. Seeing him smile and enjoy himself again was a relief. He was socializing and we had our old Bob back. Looking back, maybe I missed some signs. Kathy and I were still close, but something felt off. We were physical engaged as often as before, but something was different. After a few months, I asked Kathy if something was bothering her. Nothing really, Steve. Why do you ask? You seem a little distant lately. Everything's fine, she smiled. Maybe you haven't been getting enough lovemaking. If you want more, just ask. Lovemaking? I thought. She'd never called it that before. Always lovemaking. I smiled, kissed her, and shut down my thoughts. I'll never forget Friday, August 20th. It was the day my world fell apart. Kathy called me at work to say the kids would be with her folks for the weekend and asked what time I'd be home. I'll make sure I'm home early. Need me to pick up anything? No, just let me know when you'll be home. All right? A million thoughts ran through my mind. It was 3.30, an hour and a half before I could leave. I adjusted my pants, thinking about the fun weekend ahead. I drove home carefully to avoid a speeding ticket, but still made it in 28 minutes. I should have suspected something when I saw two cars in the driveway, but one was Bob's. Hey honey, I'm home, I called out. Bob and Kathy were in the kitchen. Hey Bob, what's going on? Steve, I need to talk to you, please have a seat. Kathy looked nervous, her voice quivering. I'll just stand, I said. Steve, I wanted to tell you myself before you get the papers. I was confused. Kathy, what papers? She stepped back. Divorce papers? She could barely say it. My heart skipped a beat. Kathy, what are you talking about? What divorce papers? Steve, Bob started, but I cut him off. Bob, stay out of this. This is between me and my wife. Then it hit me. I looked at her, then at him, then back at her. Bob, you should leave now. My hands clenched into fists. Kathy, you and I need to talk now, I shouted. Bob, stay, my wife said. Steve, this involves him too. Bob, leave now or you'll be leaving in a body bag, I warned. He headed for the door. Kathy, we need to talk. Steve, there's nothing to talk about. I'm in love with Bob. I'm sorry. You tramp. How long has this been going on? Even before Connie died? Bob stopped, his eyes burning with anger. Steve, you don't know anything. Oh, I know enough. While I was consoling you, you were screwing my wife. Get out of my house, both of you. Steve, it's my house too, Kathy said. Not anymore. Get out. I'll get my things and leave. No, leave now. Kathy, let's go. Bob said, pulling her to the door. Listen to him, I taunted. Steve, 
I'll come back for my stuff when you've cooled down. You'll be dead by then, I spat. They left, eyes fixed on me. After they left, I lost it. Two beers and a lot of destruction later. The house was a mess. I threw all of Kathy's belongings on the lawn and set the sprinklers to run for four hours. Then I locked the house and drank until I passed out. The next morning, I saw Kathy had taken her stuff. I was still angry and devastated. I didn't call anyone to tell them what happened, but I figured the neighbors knew. I called Kathy's parents to talk to my kids, but her mom wouldn't let me. Steve, Kathy picked them up last night. Nonsense, Fran. She was picking up her clothes from the lawn. Let me talk to my kids. She hung up on me. I called back, but she didn't answer. Furious, I canceled all our credit cards and withdrew all the cash I could from the bank. I made coffee, ate some toast and planned my day. Changed the garage code, get new locks and move anything valuable to my brother's house. Just as I was about to leave, the doorbell rang. I looked through the peephole and saw a man with a large envelope. He stayed for a few minutes, then left. I told my brother Gary and his wife Andy what happened and asked them to keep it quiet. Then I headed to Home Depot for new locks. On my way back, I saw Bob's car in the driveway and Kathy loading it. I should have driven by, but I was too pissed off for that. Instead of driving by, I sped up. With tires squealing, I turned into my driveway and crashed into the back of Bob's car. Bob jumped into his car just as mine made contact pushing his car against the closed garage door. I reversed about 15 feet and floored it again, driving his car through the garage door. Steam billowed from under my hood and my engine made a terrible noise, but it reversed again. I backed up 10 feet, floored it, but my car only moved Bob's a few feet before stalling. Heart pounding, I grabbed my son's aluminum bat from the garage and started swinging, smashing the driver's side windows and the windshield. I was about to open Bob's door when I heard loud voices behind me. Drop the bat and put your hands on your head, a police officer ordered. I complied, dropping the bat and kneeling down. They handcuffed me and put me in the patrol car. Bob, shaken and scared, got out of his car. I wanted to threaten him but couldn't. My wife was crying, talking to the police and looking at me. I smiled back. Taken downtown, I was booked and given one call. I called my brother Gary. Since it was the weekend, I spent two nights in jail before my court appearance on Monday. I pleaded not guilty and the judge set my bail. Gary bailed me out late that afternoon. Steve, they're talking about attempted homicide or at least assault with a deadly weapon. I know. First, take me to the bank. She's probably cleaned out the accounts, but I need to check. The cash was gone from our accounts, but not the CDs and bonds. However, a court order prevented me from removing any of them. You could have at least left me $5 in our account. You really are cheap, I told Kathy when she answered her phone. I needed that money for me and the kids. Doesn't Bob make enough money? I've got a house payment to make. Maybe I should just make a little fire in the living room, you know, just to take the chill off. Steve quit talking crazy. I'm sorry about all of this, but you're making it harder. Why can't you just accept it and move on? I'll move on when you send my kids back home. Steve, I can't, especially in your current frame of mind. I don't think you'd damage them, but I can't take that chance. After this is over, I'll let you see them as much as you want. But I can't say the same about you and Bob. This is the last time I'm talking to you. From now on, you'll have to go through my attorney. I'm sorry it happened this way. Kathy, you have no idea how sorry you and Bob are going to be. She hung up. At my court date, my attorney pleaded temporary insanity, arguing my actions were impulsive after Kathy's revelation. Kathy and Bob claimed they feared for their lives and mentioned a restraining order. Mr. Moore, the judge said, Did you tell Mr. Kelly that if he didn't leave, he'd be leaving in a body bag? I don't remember my exact words, Your Honor. It may have been something like that. But how would you feel if a friend was with your wife behind your back? The judge was unimpressed, and my lawyer quietly reprimanded me. Steve, say nothing. Do you understand? From now on, you don't remember a thing. Is that clear? I'm trying to prove you didn't know what you were doing, and your comments aren't helping. He was right. Chris, my boss and main character witness, backed me completely. He testified that I was a model employee, 
never losing my temper. After his testimony, the case closed. We awaited the judge's decision, which would come in a few days. Back at work, my boss offered to have some thugs make Bob and Kathy disappear. I declined, preferring to handle it my way. I wondered what that service might have cost. Six months and $12,000 later, I ended up screwed by both my ex-wife and the system. The divorce went through and she got 50% of everything. The house and all valuable items were to be sold. She claimed her jewelry was missing and accused me of taking it. I countered that mine was gone, too, suggesting she took it all. You're in jail. Are they nuts? I yelled at my attorney after the judge's sentence. Steve, it could be worse. You could have liquidated him and faced manslaughter. With good behavior, you'll be out in less than eight months, and your record will be clean in two years. Do the time, get out, and move on. Easy for him to say. I wasn't looking forward to spending 24 hours a day in jail. I appealed but got nowhere. Within a year, my life went from great to terrible, thanks to Kathy and Bob. Steve, your job will be waiting when you get out. Don't do anything stupid and watch your back, Chris advised. After a final visit with my kids, I turned myself in. I started my sentence in the county facility. My brother put money in my inmate account, but most items available were junk. Without a cell phone or computer, I wrote my thoughts on paper and made bi-weekly collect calls to my brother, mom, and kids to stay updated. During a visit, my brother said, I'll have your car repaired before you get out. I found someone to do it for the insurance payout. I'm taking care of your lawn and installed the new deadbolts. Kathy took the rest of her and the kids' clothes, but left the furniture after I insisted on a court order for removal. I was glad my brother was looking out for me. Kathy allowed my parents to see the kids every other Sunday, but badmouthed me and my family. She called me their jailbird father and planned to set strict rules when I got out. My parents tolerated her to keep communication open. After seven days, I confirmed my visitation rights. Every other weekend, a full month in summer and shared holidays. I informed my boss I'd need a week to readjust once released. I was thrilled to trade my orange jumpsuit for street clothes. Gary was waiting outside. We headed straight to the nearest bar. To freedom, I said, clinking our bottles before downing the first of three beers. Andy has a steak dinner with all the trimmings waiting for us. You can stay with us for a few nights until you go through your things at the house. It's still up for sale, but there haven't been any offers. Kathy wants to lower the price but needs your approval. I smiled. All the furniture is still there but I trashed the master bedroom set as you instructed. Dinner was fantastic. I ate more than I had in eight months, enjoying the freedom to do as I pleased. I drank too much, vaguely remembering five or six beers and three glasses of wine. I woke up after 10 o'clock the next morning and finally managed to get up and hit the bathroom by 11. In the kitchen, I found a note on the counter. If you're reading this, you survived last night. There's coffee made and everything else is in the fridge. The spare bathroom has soap, a razor, shaving lotion, a toothbrush, and toothpaste. If you need anything else, we'll get it tonight. The keys to your car and house are on the key rack by the back door. Don't do anything stupid. See you around 5.30. My brother knew me well. Two cups of coffee and an English muffin were all I could manage. After a shower and a shave, I felt almost human again. Gary had laid out a fresh change of clothes and within an hour, I headed to my house. The outside looked the same. I sat in my repaired car for ten minutes before going in. Memories flooded my mind. I saw the new deadbolt, and with a turn of the key, I was inside. The place was a mess, with things thrown everywhere. Clothing pieces were scattered on the floor. The kitchen was halfway clean, and the refrigerator still had old food. Leaning against the sink, I saw the damage from when my fist punched the wall and found a stud. I rubbed my knuckles, remembering that night. Upstairs, the kids' closets were empty except for a few forgotten mementos. My bedroom was almost empty except for my dresser and clothes. The dark spots on the carpet showed where our bed and her dresser had been. The room needed a complete redo before I could use it again. The rest of the house needed a thorough cleaning to be sellable, but I wasn't in a hurry to sell. I made a list of repairs and decided I just wanted it done, 
not necessarily by myself. At the bank, I confirmed she had emptied the lockbox. I needed written proof from the bank and was told they had video recordings as additional proof. My attorney confirmed she had taken everything and filed a motion to get it back. The court had already ordered Kathy to return everything she took from the lockbox. Steve, she's offering her share of the house for your share of the CDs and bonds. I told her to return everything as directed by the court or face arrest for noncompliance. She can be mad all she wants. My job is to protect your interests. That's why you hire a lawyer, I thought to myself. Back at my house, I took inventory of what I still had. I noted to call a local contractor to fix the walls and merry mains to clean the kitchen and dining room, where I'd thrown the microwave and dishes. Utilities were still on so I could move back in once I bought a bed. I just needed a queen-size bed and found a decent set for $900. At least I wouldn't be sleeping on a mattress that my ex-wife had shared with someone else. Hank, the contractor, came over Saturday morning to give me an estimate. Your walls are solid. Must have hurt when you punched that stud, he said with a smile. I just need the holes fixed and a fresh coat of white paint. Nothing special, I replied. How about $200? That's low? That's my price. Take it or leave it. You did us a favor with Bob and the car. Most of the guys in the neighborhood look up to you now. Randy even told Linda he'd put her in the grave if she ever did what Kathy did to you. You're a neighborhood hero. I thanked him and told him he could start whenever. Within six weeks, the bonds and CDs were back in the bank lockbox and the house was repaired and cleaned. Life was starting to get back to normal. When my kids spent their first weekend with me, it was awkward. I broke the ice. Kids, I know this is strange, but this is still your home. Say what you need to. My skin's thicker now and I don't think anything could shock me anymore. Dad, we love you and are sorry about what mom did, John said. Heather nodded. We didn't know about Bob until Mom said we were moving to his house. We weren't happy and still aren't. There was nothing you could do. Even without Bob, your mom and I wouldn't get back together. What we had is over. I'm still your dad and I love you. I'll always be here for you. We hugged and spent the evening with pizza and a movie. I wanted to slam their mother but decided not to. Our first weekend was a success. We ended up feeling like a family again, though different. I got John a decent haircut and life went on. I went to work, had a small social life and spent time with the kids. John started soccer and Heather dance, keeping me busy. Everyone except my brother told me to move on and start over. You're still young, you can find another girl, get married and start a new life. To them, I just say, forget it. I wasted 14 years on that witch. If I want to stay mad, that's my right. They hadn't gone through what I had over the last two years. Sometimes you need that pound of flesh to make the pain go away. And that's what I was going to get one way or another. Kathy wanted to lower the house price. I refused. She was pissed, but I didn't care. Steve, it won't sell at this price in this market. We need to drop it by at least $20,000. If you want to give up $20,000 of your share, fine. Otherwise, the price stays. We eventually divided the bonds and CDs. She spent hers on a new car and a vacation with Bob. I banked mine to start a nest egg. Eight and a half months after jail, Bob's house caught fire while they were at a soccer game. Someone had doused the electrical box and rear of the house with gasoline. The back half was ruined and they had no power. The next day, two police officers came to my door. At the station, they got nothing from me. I was at a neighborhood party with at least 10 witnesses. I said, Steve, you were only a block away. You could have done this, one officer accused. Prove it, I replied. When I'd had enough, I stood up. Charge me, release me, or I'm calling my lawyer. We're releasing you, but keeping an eye on you. Mentally, I checked off my list. One down, two to go. I volunteered to take the kids since they couldn't stay in a powerless house. Repairs would take at least two months, so we had a mini vacation together. Steve, I know you did it, no matter what the police say, Kathy said, picking up the kids one night. I don't know what you're talking about. I was with our friends. Too bad you and Bob aren't invited anymore. Maybe I could put in a good word, I suggested sarcastically. Don't bother, we wouldn't go even if they begged us. She responded, sounding bitter. Well, you have each other and that's all that matters. For now. 
What's that supposed to mean? She asked wide-eyed. Nothing, just that you two are lucky to have one another. I smiled, not just on the inside this time. The kids wanted to spend more time with me, which didn't sit well with Kathy or Bob. I heard about shouting matches between Bob and the kids, with them telling him he wasn't their father. Kathy told me to stop stirring up trouble. Kathy, I don't badmouth you to the kids. You're their mother, and I've told them they have to listen to you. How about Bob? Him? He's a backstabbing idiot who's lucky to be alive. Besides that, he's a nice enough guy. If looks could eliminate, I'd be dead. He's good to your kids. Stop badmouthing him to them. Not going to happen. He's nothing to me, and I pray I get to piss on his grave one day. She gave me a deadly look. Not that I'd injury him, of course. Steve, so help me. What are you going to do, Kathy? Cheat on me? Divorce me? Put me in jail? Make my life hell? Oh wait, you already did all those things. You can't do any more to me. Go back to your husband and leave me alone. Without another word, she walked away. And to think I once loved her. I watched her go, shaking my head. Work was going great. It took me just a couple of weeks to get back up to speed. Chris soon pushed me to take over four more accounts. With no kids or anyone else at home, I had the time. After contacting the customers, I scheduled two-day trips to each facility to get familiar with their operations. Three accounts were easy, but TW Incorporated was different. They were changing their manufacturing process, requiring monthly trips to keep up. The assigned person was knowledgeable but disorganized and arrogant when I pressed for needed data. Chris, if I don't get what we need, it'll screw up their system. After two calls, I got an intermediary between the engineer and myself. From then on, I met with Monica, who worked directly with the engineer, Steve. Monica Bradley, she introduced herself, shaking my hand. She had a degree in process engineering and had been with the company for about five years. We worked well together, and she got me everything I needed. Two weeks before finishing phase one, I asked her out to dinner. Monica, I'd like to take you and your husband out to dinner as a thank you. The Hilton where I'm staying has a great restaurant. How about six o'clock? We shook hands and I left the plant by 4.30. After catching up on paperwork and emails, I headed to the restaurant. At six o'clock, Monica arrived alone. Where's your husband? I asked, parking the car. Steve, I'm not married. Oh, sorry. I assumed. I said, noticing the rings on her hand. I wear these rings to keep things professional. No one hits on a married woman avoiding maltreatment issues. Plus, married people seem to get promoted faster. I guess because they seem more stable. How do you manage company functions? I just say he's on the road or something they don't ask anymore. Well, you had me fooled. We had a wonderful dinner, and by the end, I shared highlights of my last two years. I can't believe they did that to you. That really sucks. Tell me about it. But it's in the past, and I'm moving on with my life. I was trying to rebuild my life, though revenge was still a priority. Steve, you're young, and many women would love a guy like you, she said, smiling and blushing. You're probably right, but I haven't had the time or ambition to date again. I'm still cautious. Well, you asked me out, didn't you? You and your husband, I corrected. If I hadn't been married, would you still have asked me out? Probably. You're easy to talk to and not a pathetic twit like my ex. I'll take that as a compliment, she said, laughing. Dinner went great. I left the next day and wouldn't be back for a month. I asked her to call me weekly, especially if anything came up. I started feeling more at ease around women, even those outside my inner circle. We went out most nights when I visited, which was every couple of weeks. I still had trust issues but was working on them. Phone calls and emails kept us in touch. After a couple of months, we started kissing and more. I was finally ready to take it to the next level. Am I becoming normal again, I wondered. When Monica said she had a conflict Wednesday night, I thought nothing of it. We'd been physical engaged on Tuesday and I had forgotten to get contraceptives. Steve, let's plan for a whole evening on Thursday, she said, kissing me. Thursday, I'll remember to bring protection, I thought. Wednesday, I looked for a new restaurant on the city map. After six trips, I'd tried all the local places. I found a nice Indian restaurant about 25 minutes away and decided to give it a try. 
I ordered a beer in the sampler platter and was ready to relax. I heard a familiar laugh and to my surprise, saw Monica with another man. They were clearly on more than a first date, holding hands and laughing. I lost my appetite, finished my beer, paid, and left. She didn't seem conflicted, I thought. I avoided her on Thursday and went to McDonald's for lunch. By three o'clock, Monica was shadowing me, smiling and flirting. You take care of your conflict last night? I asked. Yes, and tonight you're all mine. I found a quiet, physical, engaged Indian restaurant with a fabulous sampler platter. I looked into her eyes. What type of food is it? Indian food. Her face went pale. I was there last night and saw someone I knew. What are the chances, Monica? I never blinked. Steve, I can explain. No need. I got rid of one lying witch. I don't need another. I walked away and cut my trip short. After ignoring four emails, I never got another one. Trust issues still plagued me and Monica had worsened them. I was reassigned to someone else, thankfully a guy. Three months later, I got an early Christmas present. Bob was run over by a car while crossing the street. Witnesses only saw a black four-door car with tinted windows, which matched my black BMW. Saturday night, the police came to my house. My neighbor, Tom, watched as they approached. Mr. Moore, we'd like a word. The shorter officer said. Sure, no problem, Tom. I'll talk to you later, I told my neighbor. Mr. Moore, do you own a 2002 320i black BMW? The other officer asked. Yes, what's this about? I replied, joking about a parking ticket, but they didn't laugh. Is the car here? Yes, it's in the garage. What's this about? I asked. Sir, we'd like to see the car now. I opened the garage. One officer retrieved a camera and started taking pictures of the front right side of my car. Can you explain these scratches and marks on the bumper? Not a clue. After eight years, some nicks and scratches are normal. Now that I've answered your questions, what's going on and why are you interested in my car? Mr. Moore, there was a hit and run yesterday, and witnesses described a black sedan with dark windows, like your car, and like a million others in town. I replied, annoyed. Why me? Did my license plate match or did anyone identify me as the driver? The witnesses only saw the car. Well, as you can see, there's no significant damage to the front end. I can account for my whereabouts from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. yesterday. Why pick on me? Your history with the sufferer and past threats prompted this visit. Thank you for your cooperation. We'll be on our way. Wait. I called as they walked back to their car. Who was hit? Mr. Robert Kelly. I smiled. Is he dead? No, but he's in critical condition. They walked away and I went inside opened a bottle of wine, and ordered a pizza. I ate most of the pizza and drank the entire bottle of wine in celebration. The neighborhood buzzed with gossip about Bob. Some said, the guy just can't catch a break, while others declared he got what he deserved. I was in seventh heaven. Two days later, Bob took a turn for the worse and died. I looked sharp in a new suit, fresh haircut and polished shoes. I even had my car washed and waxed. The funeral home wasn't packed, but there were many people outside when I arrived. Conversations stopped as I walked in. I didn't sign the book, just walked down the aisle. Kathy saw me and looked shocked. My children smiled at me. Kathy tried to stop me before I reached the casket but failed. From the moment I entered, I'd been preparing. When I reached the casket, I had plenty in my mouth. I looked at Bob lying peacefully and spat in his face enough to dribble down onto his shirt. Kathy screamed, crying and calling me every name in the book. This time I smirked openly. Two down, one to go, I said to her. She froze, fear replacing her tears. I warned you, I said softly, and walked out of the now silent funeral home. Over the next month, the cops questioned me twice more at Kathy's insistence. Just because it wasn't my car doesn't mean I wasn't involved, she claimed. They never caught the driver, and after a few months it was old news. When the patrol car arrived at my driveway, I was expecting it. I locked up my house as my neighbors watched me being taken to the police station again. Mr. Moore, do you know David Kent? One detective asked, showing me a picture. Sure do, I replied. How do you know Mr. Kent? I hired him to watch my ex-wife. 
He's been on and off for about a month. I pushed the picture back. Why did you hire Mr. Kent to watch your ex-wife? Since she took up with her now late husband, she seems to have bad luck. My kids live with her, so I hired David to ensure their safety, mostly at night. Well, your ex-wife reported being followed. She saw Mr. Kent several times and called us when we picked him up. We found out you hired him, the detective said sarcastically. Mr. Moore, this borders on maltreatment and you might be charged if it continues. I'm just looking out for my kids. I don't care what happens to my ex, but my kids are different. If this is a problem, I'll rely on your department to ensure their safety. It's not illegal, but it's pushing the limits. Why don't you talk to your ex and work something out? Last time I tried that, I went to jail. They let me go, but warned me they'd keep an eye on me. They needed a better line. I didn't pay David to be inconspicuous. I wanted Kathy to see him. The next guy I hired was even more noticeable, looking like someone from a Hell's Angels movie. He cost $30 an hour and worked three hours every fourth night. But he had the effect I wanted. I wanted to drive my ex over the edge. If she had a breakdown, I'd get the kids full time. I wanted my family back. Steve, what the hell do you want? A distraught Kathy screamed into the phone. I want you to choke on your spit and die. Kathy. She hung up immediately. Shocked. I was waiting on my porch when the police arrived. You're late, I told the officers. Kathy was charging me with threatening her life, but I had already contacted my lawyer who was waiting at the station. My client did not threaten his ex-wife, my lawyer told the police. He expressed a wish, not a threat. She took it as a threat because she's still being followed by people hired by your client. It's not illegal to have someone watched. Unless you have a recording of Mr. Moore threatening to eliminate Mrs. Kelly, you have no case. Mr. Moore, why don't you move on? She left you, it happens. If she snaps and someone gets hurt, we'll come for you. Is there a way to end this? I asked my lawyer. My client wants his children back. If Mrs. Kelly gives up custody, he'll back off. That's for the court to decide. Then we're done here, my lawyer said. And we left. The following Sunday morning, while having breakfast and reading the newspaper on the deck, the doorbell rang. I opened the door to Kathy's parents. Steve, do you have a minute to talk? Sure, come on in, I said. They were dressed for church. Can I get you a cup of coffee? No, thank you. What brings you here? I asked. Kathy's father spoke up. Steve, we know what our daughter did wasn't right, especially with you going to jail. But she's our only child, and we don't want anything to happen to her. Look. I'm not trying to injury her. She made bad choices and is paying for them. I want my children back. They're better off with me, especially since she's having bad luck. I'd hate for something to happen to them if something happens to her. They stared at me, unsure of what to say. Steve will talk to her. But you know how she is, Kathy's mother said, trying to ease the discomfort. That's where you're wrong. The woman I married would never have cheated or thrown me to the sharks. I don't recognize her now except as the mother of my children. I want her to suffer a horrible and painful end of life. I don't forgive and I don't forget. They left quickly. I think I made my point. Thursday evening, the visitor I had been expecting finally arrived. It was just after seven and getting dark. She must have walked because I didn't hear a car. She rang the bell. I looked through the peephole and let her in. She was already angry when she walked through the door. I had expected a phone call, but seeing her in person was better. Come in, Kathy. Want a drink? Acid? Hemlock on the rocks? I said, shutting the door. Very funny. You really are in prick, you know that? I reopened the door. I think we're done here. Nice of you to stop by. Have a short, miserable life, I said, holding the door open. I'm not leaving until we talk, she replied, sitting down gingerly in the living room. Suit yourself, I responded, closing the door and going to get a glass of wine. What brings you here? Our humble abode. I still own 50% of this house, she stated. Less what I've paid since the divorce, I reminded her. I want this place sold. What's it going to take to drop the price, she asked. An act of God. Are you willing to cover the loss with interest, I countered. I just want you out of this neighborhood and away from me, she declared. That's never going to happen, I said firmly. You still hate me that much, she inquired. 
More than you can imagine. It was awful how it all went down. But I never intended to get involved with Bob. It just happened, she explained. She couldn't think I was that stupid or naive. Nonsense, Kathy. Nothing just happens unless he put a weapon to your head. You went willingly. Was he so much better in bed that you destroyed our marriage and family? My anger flared. It wasn't about the lovemaking. He needed me. He had no one. We fell in love because we needed each other, she said defensively. What were you doing? Charity work? I needed you. Our kids needed you. Our marriage needed you. But you chose your needy puppy over us. Now he's dead. And a lot less needy, I retorted, smiling as I relished the memory. I only wish I had been the one driving the car that liquidated him, she confessed. Steve, you've become so hateful. Taking pleasure in someone's misfortune is sick, she admonished. I'd like to say I did this to myself, but you and your lover played a big part. That's a cop-out, Kathy. Sixty percent of marriages fail. Not all spouses go around hating the other, I pointed out. I don't care about anyone else's marriage but mine. How long was I the fool, she asked. Does it matter, I questioned. To me it does. Two months? Three? Five? She probed. About five months. It just happened the first time and I almost told you. I was devastated. She revealed calmly, sounding rehearsed. But you didn't tell me. And you weren't that devastated because it kept happening. How many times did you screw him in our bed? I demanded. Never. I wouldn't do that to you, she said angrily. So it was okay to screw him everywhere else? Many of our friends saw it but never told me. You proved you couldn't be trusted, I retorted. So where do we go from here? This house is our last connection, she said. What about the kids? I'm not giving them up. Nothing you say will change that, I asserted. My mind raced. Kathy, I'm not going to convince you. You got full custody because of what you drove me to do. If I hadn't gone nuts on Bob and his car, I might have had a chance. Bob got what he deserved. Now it's just the two of us, her eyes widened. Steve, are you threatening me, she asked. Me? Deprive my kids of their mother? I said, dripping with sarcasm. Never. But if something should happen, like a heart attack, lightning strike, or an accident, I'll make sure the kids always remember you. If you have any last requests, you might want to write them down soon. You never know what might happen. I borrowed that line from a movie where a hitman advised his target to get his affairs in order. I'm out of here, Kathy said, standing up. We had 12 good years. I'm kind of sorry it ended. She tried to kiss my cheek, but I pushed her back, almost knocking her over. Don't ever touch me again, I warned. You're a 304. She was taken aback. I'm sorry, I just thought. She began. You thought what, that we're okay now? You make my skin crawl. I said, my eyes burning with anger. Sorry, she said, flustered and horrified. Don't be, because I'm not, I retorted. She walked out and started down the driveway. By the way, you know that look you just gave me? Bob had the same look right before the car ran over him. Too bad I didn't have a camera to show you, I added. I shut the door watching Kathy run for her house. In truth, I was the one who started the fire at Bob's house. Two Gatorade bottles of gasoline and a lit cigarette were all it took. I made sure everyone was out of the house. I hoped it wouldn't be reported to the fire department until the house was fully engulfed. So much for that plan. It took less than five minutes from start to finish, including tossing the plastic Gatorade bottles into a neighbor's recycle bin. I had excused myself to go to the bathroom, slipped out the side door and went through the backyards to the back of Bob's house. No one even missed me. I'd like to take credit for Bob's end of life, but I can't. It was Bob being in the wrong place at the right time or just plain dumb luck. If he had looked both ways like his mother probably told him to as a kid, he'd still be alive. No matter what I say, Kathy and her family still think I was involved. And in a way, I'm sorry it wasn't me. But I would never have done it. I'd been locked up in jail once and I never wanted to go back. Especially not to the joint up north. Anyway, by now Kathy was probably at home locking the doors thinking she's next on my list. Am I going after her? Not a chance. I'll just drop hints and innuendos until I drive her nuts and the court gives me back my kids. I will, however, 
tell any prospective homebuyer about the arsonist in the neighborhood who still hasn't been caught. You see, I like living right where I am, especially with my two children just up the street. Who knows, when they turn 13, they might just decide to live with their old dad. Well, I can hope. The only good thing that has happened to me during all of this was meeting someone I think I may have a future with. Her name is Ellen and she works for the State Department of Corrections. I had to check in with her the first year after I was released to make sure I was adjusting, rehabilitated, and doing okay. Ellen is tough and takes no crap. After getting the formalities out of the way, we began to talk and found out we might have feelings for each other. Ethically, Ellen couldn't date me until my year of probation was up. But, finally, we were able to go out on a real date. I told her I had major trust issues and she one-upped me by telling me that most convicts lie to her in one way or another. So now we're both trying to move forward and, in the process, deal with our trust issues together while getting to know each other better. Ellen got me thinking about what I've been doing ever since that 304 of a wife walked out on me. She showed me my actions were keeping me from having any kind of real life and meaningful relationships. She told me it was time to move on. She further convinced me when she said if I messed up and got thrown back in jail, my rear would be hers to do with as she wished. And, darling, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. She explained with a smile that made the hair on the back of my neck stand straight up. And you know what? I believe her. I really do. And when I'm with her she keeps things interesting because, as tough as I think I am, Ellen is one lady I would never cross. Even better, though, is knowing in my heart she would never cross me either. I think I am finally ready to move on with my life and open myself up to love once again. Ellen.